So where we left off last week was actually, there was actually no deep learning. There was no learning of any sort last week, actually. Um, all it was, was um, basically, basically this. We, we uh, had this Kickstarter data. We talked about that because that's going to be the data for the next, uh, well, it's going to be for the subsequent two chapters, for the last two chapters, it'll be the data. Um, and so one of the things we talked about was using a recipe. So it's using the, the tidy models framework um, sort of this is like without an outcome. It's like all we're doing in this recipe is preparing the data. Um, and, and so how to do it with uh, text recipes. That's this, these, all three of these um, functions come from text recipes. Recipe comes from recipes. Um, anyway, so we, we tokenized the data. We got a token filter so that we only had max words, which are set to 20,000, which I later learned that uh, 20,000 is like an unofficial, like the correct amount of words. And I have no idea why. It seems like a very strange statement, but I did read that in um, in uh, a deep learning book that is like authoritative. And so I thought that was a very strange statement, but okay. Um, I'm and Justin, I missed that. What do you say, please? So um, in, in preparation for this, I, I was reading, um, like the, the guy who came up with Keras, his name's Francois Cholet. Uh, he, he's authored two books. One is, I mean, they're like the same book, but one is for, um, I mean, maybe he's authored more. But anyway, the point is he's, he has one that's uh, deep learning for Python and he has deep learning for R. And in that book, in those books, he says that 20,000, he just said, and it was like a very strange statement. So it stood out to me. It's like 20,000, that's the right amount of words for, for, uh, for, for text analysis. So 20,000, so that's what this is, max words, 20,000. And then max words, well, what is that? That's just like the words in our, our dictionary, um, basically. So there's 20,000 most frequent words that exist in whatever um, corpus we're, we're analyzing, or specifically training set, I guess. But anyway, so, yeah. Is there any relationship between the number of words uh, in dictionary and these twenty thousand? I mean, it, that just is the length of our dictionary. Basically, the comment is that imagine you have a dictionary; it should have twenty thousand entries in it, and those okay, are the yeah. number of words we should recognize. Okay, cool. Um, but there wasn't really any justification given for that. It was just kind of that's the statement. Um, in any case, so that's where we are. Um, so we basically ignore, we sort of acknowledge 20,000 tokens. Um, and then there was this one hot encoding and there was that. And then so um, now what we need to do is to- Wait, hold on, sorry. Yes. So the token filter um, step by default takes the, um, the top X amount of, Words, max words. Yeah. So, so in, in this case, okay. the max max tokens you give it, you know, an, an integer, some integer. In this case, twenty thousand, and it will, you know, I guess under the hood, it counts. It gets like it counts up all the words, okay. and uh, gets their frequencies, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, and so the twenty thousand most frequently occurring words are the ones that are preserved in the dictionary. That's it. It. Okay. And so then once we've done that, um, so that th this is just creating the recipe, right? That's like the outline of what we want to do. This actually uh, uses the training. So this is the Kickstarter train. So it actually uses the Kickstarter train to um, calculate these things, like figure out, uh, for example, what the 20,000 words are going to be. And then we bake it. And so that means that we actually apply the prepped recipe to, uh, in this case, the, the same data, so the KS train. Okay, so that's, that's what the data looks like. Well, it's not really, it's a description of what the data looks like. So now I should be able to run this. Um, okay, I think this is actually not as bad as it looks. Um, so this is one of the stressful things about using Keras is that you get a bunch of things that in normal times you would say, I failed. Um, but, uh, 
you know, I hope this, I hope this, let me, let me see. Let me try to run the next code. Let me try to compile this. Okay, it didn't, anyway, yes. So this always stresses me out. I think I lose like a week of my life every time I see this. Um, in any case, okay, so Keras, we need to load Keras, even though we're gonna be working in tidy models. And that gets us all of these, um, well, Keras functions. So um, there are two different ways that you can build a, a model in Keras. You can either build it the, the sequential way, or you can build it in a, a functional way. And the functional way is more advanced. So don't ask me about it. And, <laughs> and, uh, and also the book authors uh, don't, don't mention that particular model. The nice thing about sequential is that it's very intuitive um, because what we're literally doing is uh, building the model layer by layer. So, so we're just gonna use all these functions that are like layer this thing, layer that thing, layer this thing. And so what are our particular layers in this case? Um, I'm gonna hide this red, that's stressing me out. Um, Okay, so okay, so here, this just says we're gonna build a model sequentially um, and then embedding. So this is something that we actually talked about um, a few, well, I guess now probably uh, a month or two ago um, that when you have uh, words in really high dimensional space, one thing that you can do is encode the semantic relationships between words geometrically in a, a vector space. So that's actually what, what this is doing is, so it's taking our, our words, which each word, um, and this is something that we also talked about a little bit last week, but so this one hot encoding of each word means that each individual word, um, it has like an integer associated with it. So we'll say dog appears in the data set because I'm sure someone's in the Kickstarter, someone's, someone's selling something related to dog. So dog will probably be in there. And um, let's say that has an integer uh, 3,085 associated with it. And so the way dog is represented in this one hot way is a, a 20,000 a vector and a 20,000 dimension vector. Um, and then at the index or at, on dimension 3,085, there's a one, everything else is a zero. So like that's how each individual word is represented in our data set right now because of the one hot encoding. And so what, oops, went too far. So what this layer embedding will do, it will take that number, which again, max words is 20,000. So the input, and this plus one is a mystery to me. I do not know why this plus one is here. So I cannot answer any questions about it. I thought at one point it was something to do with like an, an intercept. And then I thought, no. And then I thought there's, there are other little things that it might be, but Interestingly, a bias it doesn't... term, maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's very good. You're using the deep, the DL lingo. I still call them intercepts, but yes, a bias term. I thought. Um, sorry, I, I have a particular fascination with deep learning lingo um, to produce actionable insights at scale. I don't know. I just, I just feel like it's fun to use business speak. In any case, um, the point is that. Um, We'll, we'll say it's the bias term. I, I don't think that I, something inside me deep <laughs> doesn't think that's what it is, but that's as good as any of my guesses. Um, okay, so what, what this embedding layer is going to do is take this, you know, these these vectors that are of that dimension. Uh, so this is 20,001, and it's going to embed them. It's going to put them in a dense 12 dimensional space. So that's a huge reduction in dimensionality. And this input length, what that's, what that's saying is that each data point, so each um, piece of text, each blurb that we're giving it is of length, max length. And this was another thing we talked about last week that each, uh, unlike a bag of words model, um, each uh, input has to have the same number, the same length. So what we've done is I think I put 25 25 is the length for every single entry. So basically what it does- Sorry, is, what do you say? Sorry to cut you off. So that they, what two have to be the same length? So, um, so let's say that there's some blurb that's uh, someone wrote, I don't know, um, 35 words in their blurb, mm -hmm. in the Kickstarter blurb. Another person only wrote 10 words. So in a bag of words model, like we've done before, that wouldn't, like we wouldn't have to think twice about that. I mean, maybe we should think twice about that, but like 
for the model for the model's purposes, it uh, it doesn't matter, right? We can just do get like the we tokenize those and then we put like ones or counts or something where the words appear and zeros for every other thing and it's fine. It doesn't matter that one's ten and one's thirty five. Now for this deep learning um, architecture, every single blurb has to have the same number of words. And so we force them to have the same number of words by picking a number of words and any blurb that goes over that amount, we cut off, we truncate the blurb. And any blurb that has fewer than that number of words, we add zeros to either the front or the back and that's called zero padding. So that gets all of them to have the same, uh, the same length. So, and that's just part of the, the deep learning architecture. And the way that I, I think about it is like, if you were processing image data, they would all have to have the same number of pixels, for example. Um, and in this case, and so that would be like the, the length. And so, yeah, so that, that's, what, that's what this is. That's what the input length is. And so, so yeah, so this takes, so I think, again, I think mine was 25. I think in the book they use 30, I use 25. Um, and so really the, like, it's kind of weird to think about this, but every single um, data point that we, or every single, um, what we typically think of as a row um, actually has, is a matrix where it is 25 by, it starts out as 25 by, um, 20,001, 20, and then we crunch it down to 25 by 12. And so, yeah. Um, and then, so what we do with that, so we have this 25 by 12 um, kind of like uh, matrix, and then we flatten it out into a vector. And so what that does is basically takes out, takes out, which dimension does it take out? Anyway, uh, I don't want to, well, not too long, but anyway, it like sort of knocks out one of the dimensions and makes it just a big column, I believe. Um, so that's this flatten layer does. And then after that, we have one hidden layer with 32 units. So that's 32 little nodes uh, that all have a ReLU activation function. And then because this is a classification problem, um, we have one unit at the output. So there's only one, one thing we're predicting. Um, and the activation is a sigmoid. Uh, so it's just like a logistic transformation. Uh, so, that'll, so it'll output probabilities is what this is saying. Okay. Um, any- So the last layer is the output layer, right? The yes. sigmoid, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh -huh. Okay, so um, now, okay, I already ran this. So there's one, one brief thing to comment on here. Um, I guess there are multiple things one could comment on, but notice that the syntax is both familiar and strange in that, I mean, it's a pipe, you know, it's, it's definitely R, but um, you know, if this were any other context, we would think that nothing is like changing here while we're just outputting something. But because this is actually interfacing with Python, under the hood, what's actually going on is that we're modifying in place the dense model. So I ran this once. I think if I ran it again, it wouldn't do anything different because I would just be repeating myself. But um, in any case, this actually does change the uh, object that's being referred to. And so what happens here is, so we've established the architecture, right? The, the layers. And now we have to say what type of optimizer we're going to use. Um, which is how backpropagation is going to work, and then what type of law, which loss function, and then so these two uh, jointly determine how the model fitting is going to go, and then we can specify metrics that get printed out with each epoch. Which, um, if epoch is a weird thing, uh, it'll become a little bit less weird in a second. Um, okay. So there, I even wrote that metric, you, not used for fitting for human consumption only. Um, okay, again, at any point you can ask questions, I encourage it, if they're easy questions. If they're hard questions, I disencourage it. Um, all right, so. Um, yeah, question. So can you go up a little bit? 
All right, I'll go up in a second. I think something interesting might be about to happen. So notice um, what, what happens in R as we do this. We get this nice little um, interactive graph here in the viewer um, where we can, in real time, see what, what's going on with okay. um, here below is the accuracy and here above is the loss. And so now it's wrapping up, it's on its 19th epoch. And so presently this will be, this will be done. But just as it's finishing, what you can see is that we have a blue, sorry, um, right, blue is the, the training data and, uh, well, I guess it's all the training data. The way they put it is, is that blue is the analysis and then green is the assessment or validation set. Um, anyway, we can come, I'll, I can come back to this in a second. So Sham, you had, you're going to ask a question. Oh yeah, um, a little bit um, where we have that pipe. So here, so yeah. um, this dense model, um, the, the um, pipe operator is actually, um, as you said, um, modifying the object dense model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. so in Python, as you said, like it's just like dot, like they said the model dot compile. So here in R, then we use a pipe to modify the dense, the model, the object of the model we created above. Instead of using dot, we use this pipe, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and actually, um, that that even applies here. Um, so here, like, imagine that I were to delete this part, then. I would still actually be, and so I delete, so we imagine I, I delete that. This would actually still fit the model. But the nice thing about assigning something yeah. to dense history is that then I can mm -hmm. keep, yeah, I can keep this information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's the, the same thing that happens in, in Python as well. Um, and so this is a nice uh, output. I, I like that. And it's you know fun to see your model being fit. Um, but you can also plot it, um, and and you get the so so if you so that's the nice thing again about saving uh, the history of the model uh, fitting. I don't know why they they use a the, the default for this is to use um, a uh, what is it low s low s to fit these lines, which I don't quite understand that. I don't know. I don't. I guess to make them smooth, you could just use geom line um in any case um so they're they're i think less beautiful versions of uh, what happened over here but um in any case the things to note um are that um each time we run through the model we uh, improve its fit to the training data so we see the loss uh by the one two three four five six seven eight I'd say by the eighth epoch, there's zero loss, and correspondingly, there's a perfect accuracy. And we see that the validation set loss uh, pretty much increases, and then that kind of flattens out up here. Um, and so there's actually never a really big loss. I mean, this is kind of a bizarre thing to me. Um, it never gets above, I mean, it, it sort of immediately decreases in accuracy. So I would not call this a success. Uh, yeah. It's interesting that there's like such a large disparity in the training. Like the training is very almost perfect, but our validation set is not good. It How does is that not happen? Good. So um, I would say if I if I print out dense model. Um, <clears throat> So one thing to note is that we have an incredible number of parameters. So notice that uh, in this, the very first embedding layer, we've, you know, we're creating 240,000 parameters. You know, here we've almost got a thousand parameters to round. So we have so many parameters that it's actually, when you think about it that way, it's not that surprising that we get perfect accuracy. 
Um, just, yeah. So, and that's it. So, oh, there it is. Total number of parameters. Yeah. Basically 250 I mean, that makes sense. But the, I, I'm, I mean, typically you kind of see like, don't you normally see like similar, like almost similar patterns between your validation and your training set? Um, well, I mean, I would, I don't know. I'm not. But I not so, not like not as huge of a difference. Like this is like incredibly, like almost opposite. Mm -hmm. I, I think the thing that does surprise me, <clears throat> um, which is, is related, is that accuracy really never goes up. That's to me just the kind of wild thing. Like at no point does accuracy on the validation set go up which of course that's the accuracy we're, we're more interested in because that's mm -hmm. the proxy for out of sample accuracy. Anyway, yeah. so, so not, not a huge success, um, but I'm gonna go through this a little bit, a little bit quicker now because I've somehow always managed to do this. All right, so, um, but again, I, I encourage all easy questions. Um, so for the validations, uh, so another way to do this that I didn't comment on before, I probably should have, is, let me scroll up. So when we fit the model, um, I mean, there are a couple of things I could have noted here. First, no formula. Uh, this is a very Python, I, to me, it's a very Pythonic way of saying what the model is. You specify the X, so the regressors, explanatory variables, features, whatever you want to call them. Um, and you specify the Y, which is you know the output, the outcome. Um, and there's batch size, which is something we didn't talk about, but so typically every uh, update of the model's parameters, like you don't actually use all of the X data in deep learning, you won't use all the X data, you use some fraction. Usually I learned that it's a power of two. So you use some power of two uh, as a batch size. And that's just related to the GPU stuff, I'm pretty sure. Um, so yeah, so you have a batch size, uh, you specify the number of epochs, and this is what I wanted to get to, is that you also specify um, a validation split. So if we had not, so if we had put zero here, I don't think it would have given me an error. It maybe should have, or maybe it would have, um, but the purpose, the thing is that we wouldn't get this green line. So, um, or the series of green dots. Sean, I see yeah. you're wanting to say um, something. Oh yeah. Um... So this batch size, um, I remember the other time we were working like um, the, um, we had like, if you put a large number of batch size um, and your GPU cannot support that, you will have a constant error. So it turns out that I had to reduce some models because they are large. I had to reduce like the batch size to one and it's perfectly, yeah. Some I need to do the batch size to be two because the models is like huge. So, um, yeah, so the batch size depends on the hardware one that you have. So if you have a very um, constrained hardware, so even um, a model uh, runs on other people with a particular batch size, so um, you should know like you can reduce the batch size to fit your own GPU. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's good to know. Um... Okay, I yeah um I also like um so as you said for G um deep learning so in machine learning classical machine learning we just give the model our data right but um in G in deep learning um you need to give models in batches right um I don't know like um I mean under the hood um do you think of anything why deep learning models need um the data not in its entirety, it should be in budget. I know this is how it is, but I don't know if you have why. Um, it's, we should give its data in budget, why? So the batch size is basically how many samples of your data is gonna get back propagated. Um, so they, uh, you typically do that for um, in these like uh, contextual analysis, for example, like um, general adversarial networks or something like this. 
and because you want to basically adjust the weights for each each of the um, hidden layers for each node to reduce your, your um, error from the cost function, cost function. So so like ReLU is the activation function here. So you would take each of those batches and back propagate through each epoch um, to find the uh, lowest um, error. Okay, yeah. So I understand like um, the reason why it's you say like, um, um, so of course, if we have a single batch, we can still have be able to put back propagate, right? If we have a single batch, so we can back propagate. Um, yeah, and I think in theory, but yeah, I think that yeah. you would kind of be doing an injustice to your model because then you don't know. I mean, if you get it, if you get you know good performance, then sure. But I don't think that I think it takes a a couple. Take several, I think. Um, I don't know. I think in theory. Yeah, I understand um, <laughs> when you're trying to make like um, just to be able to adjust the error um, for each um, batch so that you can be able to compute back for, for, again, for each batch. But the point is, even with a single batch, batch size, if you say one batch size, your model can still run. But I think, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, um, I'll just, just as my own little little thing about that. Um, the way that the, the mini batch uh, thing was explained to me once upon a time, um, so this batch size. Uh, so, so, right, and so the way it's, I think, typically brought up is that, is kind of what, what Sham said is that, okay, so in, like, this is like a new idea in machine learning, typically, right? You just throw all your data at once and it fits it all simultaneously. Uh, and the way it was explained to me uh, with this batch size thing, so using mini batches uh, and updating on mini batches is that you can think of um, your data as a population and each mini batch is a sample from that. And so actually you can, um, and, you know, just like in, in inferential statistics, the idea is always you take a sample from a population and you, as long as it's a random sample, you get information about that population. And so with this batch size, so within, I think about how to put this. So in one epoch, let's say that there are like, let's say their data set's really big. Uh, it's actually not that big. Let's say, no, it's pretty big. Let's say that there are a hundred batches basically in one like we have enough for a hundred batches in um, one in our training set. And so what that would mean is that in one epoch, we can actually like get a hundred samples and use those to get like a really good estimate um, like a hundred times. It's almost like doing a hundred epochs in one epoch kind of. And so that's the way it was brought up to, with me. It was like, there's like, it's really efficient to do uh, batches like this. So as an efficiency increasing measure, that's how I was taught. I was, yeah. So I was saying like, yeah, like um, one of the advantage of the batch size, like you train the network faster, right? Because like, if you pick small batches, uh, you track the network faster rather than training um, the whole um, batches at once. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So we've only got 20, 20 minutes. So I'm gonna try to do this fast. So um, I think while we were talking, the chapter is so interesting, Justin. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm glad. Um, so so now we're gonna use an R sample function uh, validation split. So basically, what we're doing now, uh, I guess to put this in context, is before what we did was we let um, Keras pick out a random 25% of the test of our, I'm sorry, of our training data as a validate and set it aside as a validation uh, set. And so now what we're gonna do is do that ourselves. So we're gonna create a validation split and then we have to use these. Um, um, yeah, um, <clears throat> sorry, Justin, I have a question. Can you go up a little bit? Just ask one simple 
think uh, go up, go up. I forgot the question I want. Go up, yeah. Up, up, up where we have the training. The, the train? Yeah, where we do the train, some figures, yeah. where I do training, yeah. Go, um, where we, okay, maybe this one that we train, uh, where I see some figures, where we see the batch size, the training stuff result. Is this it? I hear batch size is here. Uh, the output of the training, when you were training, some output that coming up, some figures. Oh, so uh, maybe this. Um, okay, no. So, um, okay, so yeah, I think that, um, that might be lost, what you were saying. I think I, I closed it, and I think okay, that, that... Okay, okay, we can move on, move on. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So um, basically, this is just uh, tidy models code to get... So, so we're reprocessing um, the training data, but now we've got an analysis set, um, an assessment set. So that's what you, when you do the validation split, your training data becomes two different, becomes it's like its own training data and its own test data. And you call those, now they have different names to add to confusion. Uh, so there's analysis set and assessment set, which is basically training and test. And this part is the exact same um, here, this model. So this is actually gonna overwrite the model that we did before, which is, is fine. Um, and so this part, is exactly the same. So this whole code block is just a repeat, but we're kind of refreshing what happened. And then this part is, is slightly new. Um, so yeah, I even wrote the key change from last, the last session or the last um, iteration. So again, so now we just specify that we're using the analysis sets as our X and Y to fit actually to fit the model. And then the validation data is passed as a list where the first element or the first item is the assessment, sorry, is the, the, the data, and this is the, um, the output. So anyway, so you can run that, and um, it's only gonna go for 10 epochs because overfitting happens. You know, in fact, I'll just put it for five uh, because it's gonna overfit really quickly. Oh, and then Sean, maybe this will remind you of what you wanted to see because this output should be the, oh, okay, just kidding. Uh, that's a mystery, I don't know why it, uh, didn't give all the nice output. Um, okay, but so now we can see what that pot looks like. Interestingly, it uh, I guess maybe with five points, it uh, too few to make a line, but we see the same pattern, um, even though there's not a nice line. So uh, with validation, we see that accuracy increases from just over 70% and kind of gets to 70, 6% maybe, 77%, it kind of flatlines, whereas our uh, training accuracy just goes basically up to one. So it maxed out specifically at 95.64%. Oh, and this maxed out or ended at 77.74%. Um, and so there's not, this isn't really anything new, but I think it's probably best to use the, this like explicit validation set approach because then, um, I'm not, this code, I just copied straight from the, uh, the book. So normally in tidy models, you can use this nice collect predictions function. Um, and I'm guessing that for some reason with Keras, you can't, you have to actually build a predict function. So that's what this does. Um, and again, I'm going to skip over that. Um, the point though, is that you can use this Keras predict function that they create. Um, just like you would use the collect predictions and collect metrics things we'll see. So, um, so for example, we can see accuracy 77.7, blah, 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 which is the exact same thing we got uh, up here. So, but the point is that um, now we can do stuff like this, like this is uh, in the yardstick part of tidy models, the yardstick domain, we can get, you know, uh, confusion matrices. Um, we can get these uh, receiver operating curves and whatnot. So that's why it's probably good to, to use the explicit validation set approach. Um, but but that's, this is all just classification stuff basically. So I'm not gonna dwell on it too long. Okay, so, um, so what we did just now was we, um, we looked at um, this embedding so that we trained our own embedding layers. 
But we can also use like a more familiar architecture um, where we use a bag of words and you can use a deep bag of words or a neural bag of words. Um, so again, this first section is actually not deep learning. This is just make, make, this is getting our data into the appropriate form. Um, and so this is actually the same. So again, we're processing the blurb column from the training data. Uh, we're tokenizing it, we're moving stop words. We're setting a max number of tokens. I doubled it from what they had in the book. In the book, they only had a thousand, which is very few. So I put it into 2000. Um, and then there's, uh, this actually is the, the final step. This is what makes it a bag of words. Um, it gives us a term frequency matrix. And so now we need to do the same prep. And again, that's just tidy model stuff. So I'm gonna kind of flow through it. Um, I guess I'll take a second to do all the preparation. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna have a uh, analysis and assessment set. And so notice that they are, let's see, so we're prepping the recipe. So it's using the training data and then, yeah, so using this, it's gonna bake sort of this, uh, so it's gonna get the analysis set and the assessment set. Um, and then, so while that's, oh, there it finished, uh, almost. So now our model, um, this is the second model we've seen, the second architecture. So what this is gonna have, so again, we're using the sequential way of setting up the thing. Um, we have two dense layers. So before we only had one dense layer, one hidden layer. Um, now we have two. I guess before we had two dense layers, but one of them was the output layer. So we have three dense layers now, two of them are hidden. Both of them have 64 units. Uh, and this here is just saying that it is accepting uh, the input is 20,000. So um, the compilation is the same. So I'm just gonna run this real quick. Okay, so now this is actually gonna fit. So we'll see this. Um, And sadly, sadly, I'm guessing this is something to do with my decrepit old computer, but now it's no longer printing out the like live fitting of the model, which is kind of kind of sad because it was pretty fun. But it finished. And so one thing that we can actually see um, is so the relative how, how these things went. Well, hold on. Let, let's just look at the final how this thing did. Uh, so if I do POW history, so we see here um, that the accuracy again uh, is actually a little bit lower. So this is again training set. So we don't get hundred percent. We get, I and mean, we probably could have, you know, if we um, wanted to have more epochs. Um, but so it's basically ninety nine percent. But nicely, um, and I don't think this is what happens in the book. Um, the validation accuracy is 77.78, which I think is just slightly higher, ever so slightly higher um, than, let's see, dense history. Yeah, oh, it's actually a, a decent amount higher. Um, so it's more than 2% higher. By the way, this is something, go ahead, Sean. Um, okay, this is validation loss. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, we have a loss at the top. <laughs> I was looking at the loss and it, I can see it's one point something. I was saying, what? The loss is too big. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, so I saw the loss at the top. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so, so these um, I think are things that we don't really care about um, because this is on the training set. And, uh, and I think we should expect that these things are basically gonna be zero and one respectively, or we could get them to zero and one uh, in the limit. And we don't really care about that. What we really care about are these things. And, um, and so, yeah, so this is, I found this to be interesting because like I said, in the, in the book, um, they, they don't get as good results with the bag of words and I get better results with the bag of words. Um, so I don't, that's just, uh, and I, I was comforted um, when I was reading the deep learning for Python book 
And yes, I do admit I was reading the Python one because there was a second edition that came out just last year. So it's a little bit more updated than the R book. Um, and that guy also got better results for a bag of words. So, uh, so I just thought I'd point that out. So, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and this is just the same uh, using the sort of hand rolled predict function and then using the yardstick um, function metrics to get accuracy. Oh, and this is a, a you know a classification metric that I'm not really used to seeing, but is apparently it seems interesting. So it, it takes into account what a uh, like a baseline model would do, and then sees how much better your model is than the baseline model. Um, so I don't know the exact calculation, but kappa that's what it is. It's somebody's kappa, if I'm not mistaken. Um, all right, there's only 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna to try to think about this, what should we do? Um, yeah, I'll just go with this as fast as I, well, um, maybe I, I just won't do this, but what I'll point out are some things about this. So there's the text data package. The text data package will give you um, these glove embeddings and glove embeddings are uh, the same type of embeddings we talked about before where you take uh, a word that's in, you know, however long, your dictionary is, that's whatever space your word is in. Um, and then it, and it's a very sparse vector because um, it's zero in all dimensions, except for the, there's a one wherever the index of your word is. Um, and so this will embed it. And then in this case, we say we only want like 50 dimensions. I think maximum number of dimensions for glove is a hundred. And I, mean, I guess I can just do this. So what that'll look like uh, is this. So for example, these are all the, the tokens. And then in this case, we've limited it. Well, the book, I don't know, uh, says, okay, let's just only look at the first, uh, I guess, 12 dimensions. And so, so anyway, so this is like the representation of the, you know, um, it's this and then up. And so we see that that, and then there's a lot of stuff, and this is what I'm gonna skip over, um, that is basically just how would you get this, all of this, into the format you need to like stick it into your Keras model. Uh, and there's a decent amount, like you really have to kind of know what's going on under the hood. Like, um, I, like I'm not, I'm not gonna go over this, but I will say that I kind of despaired a little bit when I was like, man, you really have to, it's like being a car mechanic. You like have to get in there and, uh, and do quite a bit. So this is them. So this is Ukraine, the architecture. So that actually kind of looks very similar, but now see, we're starting to take into account this uh, embedding matrix. And then this is the real new, this is the novel part where we're actually setting the weights. So what we do is we take our model that I'm not gonna uh, run, but um, so we, we get a layer. So it's layer one. So we see it's the embedding layer, um, which is kind of weird. Python has zero indexing. So I'm not, that's a little bit confusing, but anyway, so it's the first layer. Maybe, maybe it's, anyway, um, we set the weights and we pass the weights as a list. So we take the matrix, make the list. Again, this is all like real under the hood knowledge. And then we, and then we freeze the weights. So that means that when back propagation goes through, it's not gonna change uh, that layer. So uh, the, comp the compilation is the same and all this is the same. And the upshot, if I were to run all this, is that these models would do pretty poorly. Um, and what that, that means is that we have enough data or that our, it can mean two things, I guess. One is that we have enough data to learn better embeddings for our, our application, <clears throat> not globally better embeddings, but for our application, we can learn better embeddings. Uh, and then I guess relatedly, it's not a separate point that our application is different enough from the original text that it was worth it to learn better embeddings. And so what I mean by that is that these glove embeddings come from Newswire articles and uh, Wikipedia, uh, which are both of which are more formal than Kickstarter blurbs. So it's like a different, you think of it almost as a different dialect of English. So a different semantic space, if you wanna be more fancy sounding. Um, I'm also gonna kind of skip over this. So if you wanna do cross-validation in the context of deep learning, 
Uh, it's not nearly as simple as it is in the context of machine learning. Um, so yeah, so basically they create a function that what it will do is take a split object. So for example, the fold, so this is like a five fold cross validation. So what you do is you pass it to here, the split argument, and then we have our uh, prepped recipe. And basically what it does is, so it's gonna, as a, again, this is them creating a function where they take the train validation, da, 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 and they fit the model. And anyway, they, they save it, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, they, they say that for at least this application, and I have a feeling for most applications, in deep learning, if you're proper, if you're doing, if it's advised that you're doing deep learning, your validation set is going to be big enough that you don't need to do cross validation, because cross validation, like the advantage of cross validation over validation, uh, is just that you get a better estimate of your test statistics, what they will be, um, because right. So if you did like five fold cross validation, you get basically five estimates of your test performance, but um, and the reason you want five is because there's sampling variability, right? Blah, blah, blah. But if, you're, if your validation set is huge, then you might only need one. So that, that's the point. But again, um, go ahead, Sean. Um, how, how huge you mean? So if I have like 1,000 as validation, is that huge? 1,000 instances, I mean. Right. I mean, that is, that is very big um, in the sense of for, like, unless you think that the, I mean, it's not very big in like the deep learning sense where you can have millions, right? Um, so in that sense, it's small, but as far as if you think about um, like the formula for, for a standard error, which is the standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample. Um, so that would be like an 100 fold reduction. So if you have a thousand, that's an 100 fold Sorry, no, that's that just kidding. So the square root of a, you're reducing the variance of that number by the square root of a thousand, uh, which is actually a pretty big reduction in that. So, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, that's the way that you would, you would think about, is it big or not? It's like, how much, how accurate is this, um, this estimate gonna be? And, you know, I don't have like a really good intuition for how much uh, deep learning models, like how much variance there is in their estimates. So, so I don't know. One thing I, I will see, say is that, no, I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say. I, I, I refrain. Um, and anyway, the, the point is, since we're running out of time, since I'm running out of time, uh, is that they 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 do cross validation and then they just don't do anything with cross validation. They say no, it was too big. But here's here's some code anyway. If you want to do cross validation on your on your for your application, and actually now that I think about it, I can mention that their conclusion for pre-trained word embeddings was very similar. It was like, well, this was not we didn't need to do this basically because we have so much data that we can learn better embeddings. But if you do not have enough data to learn better embeddings, then you should use pre-trained word embeddings. So, uh, so for, I guess for both cross-validation and pre-trained word embeddings, those are kind of like the upshots. And so this, and sadly, I won't be able to run because this all, a lot of this code depends on um, having run a lot of the stuff before. But again, um, what I will say, and that they did not include that, that I, for some reason, have become a champion of bag of words. So I made sure to include that. And then, in this case, for me, bag of words outperformed all other models. So the rank ordering would be bag of words, best, um, then just your dense model where we learn the embeddings, the frozen, uh, the frozen, like pre-trained word embeddings was the worst. And then there was one that I think I didn't talk about that I skipped over where they did the, they gave the model the pre-trained word embeddings but then they allowed those to be modified by the model. And then that one um, performed in between just learning them. So basically starting off with random weights and learning them. Um, so that was actually kind of counterintuitive to me that like a random initialization 
started off or ended up being better than a smart initialization is how you can kind of think of it. Uh, I don't have a good intuition for why a theoretically better starting point performed worse, but that is what happened. I mean, I think that's the million dollar question, right? This is a black box. So I'm sure there's some like some explanation, but yeah, mystery. Yeah. Um, and one, oh, one thing, let's see, I might actually be able to run this. Let me see. Uh, okay. And so one, one nice thing, there it is. So this is the dense network, how it performs on the test data. So it gets a nice accuracy of 78%. Um, I mean, I, I guess that's actually not that high, but um, let's see, what do I do here? Oh, okay, so let's see, I say in the book, they abandoned the bag of words model, but we can see how it did. So 78.6 for bag of words, 78.2 for, for the fully learned word embedding dense model. Um, and one nice thing that they say that we can do is we can look at, for example, we can um, get the results. We can bind the actual test data uh, to this. And we can say like, okay, what is a, observation where the true success uh, is one, so it was successful, but we predicted that it had less than a 20% chance, or the model predicted that it had less than 20% chance of being a success. So this is their way of like, uh, this is their suggestion for how we can do model diagnostics, right? So, so, you know, this one, gallery has to move, please help, right? We said, no, less than, I guess, I don't know. Um, let me get rid of this one real quick. So, um, okay. So we can see that, for example, this one had less than a 5% uh, chance of predicted success, but it was, what was this? Independent pop from Southern Cali. I don't know. So, I mean, imagine, I would imagine this had some nice, uh, some nice visuals that didn't get picked up in the blurb column. Anyway, we can do the same, but for the opposite, we were true success is, uh, so the ground truth it was that it was a failure, the Kickstarter campaign. We predicted it had more than 80% chance. And we can like look at what those blurbs look like. Uh, five infinity stones in a 14K gold, solid gold ring. I, can, I think I would have predicted that that would have not. <laughs> That's probably gonna be pretty expensive. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna start making jokes about these. So let's, let's, call, <laughs> let's call it a, a day there, but anyway, I, I, it's a nice it's a nice way of doing model diagnostics. Um, but yeah, we can wrap it up. That's kind of cool. Cool. I like that. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, awesome. Oh, we have two more chapters, I think, to go down the book. All right. Um, do you have the um? Do any of you have the spreadsheet up? Uh, I do not, but I do know that Sham signed up for the next chapter, and then I signed up for the last chapter. Oh, you did. Okay. But if you want to do it, that's fine. I'm not. <clears throat> um, I have so no the, idea. La the last chapter is convolutional neural networks. Oh yay! <laughs> I didn't even check. Um, uh, 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, the next chapter is convolutional, and I will be happy to do that. I, I no, no. The, the last chapter. No, the last one. The last one. Ah, okay. Was, the next so, one. Oh, oh. You signed up for, uh, Sean, you signed up for long term short. I forget. It's LTSM. Yeah. LTSM. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So, um, I think our GitHub, the book is not updated. Um, maybe uh, um, Justin, you can share with me this your slide um, so that I can. Yeah, I still have problems. Like I, I was talking to John, like about my chapter about how like it, it can't run. <laughs> like this book would take forever to compile. 
and his okay. thing was basically just like uh his advice was to save the chunks and reuse those but then the thing is is that the chunks themselves are large files which means i'll have to push those um objects so i honestly like i think i'm just going to set everything to eval equals false and just push the in the markdown okay for chapter yeah. seven okay cool All right so um thank you justin and thank you Lena. so we see you next week yay okay oh by the um, way i'm actually doing the yeah. i'm actually my one of my classes this quarter is um uh natural language processing with deep learning so that's why that's when i was like oh yeah maybe i can do the uh, the convolutional neural network because like everything that we're talking about right now is incredibly relevant to my class <laughs> i can't like i actually have to uh understand this um oh. but yeah the yeah maybe we could like work on it together or something yeah, we can all just get together and have a study session for that class. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, please be my study buddy. I need someone to hold me accountable. It's actually pretty intense. Like the because these are quarter systems, it's only 10 weeks. It's like the first session's already like it's already been jump started. I'm like, oh yeah. It's all Python though. Yeah, I will I, I don't know if you've seen this book, but the one that I referenced a few times is actually really good. I definitely yeah. recommend it. I actually have it in my cart right now. I've heard about, I've heard it like so many times like the French Wash Chalet. Um, I just never occurred to me to actually buy the book. So yeah. I actually have it in my cart. Um, I mean, the book is easy read. And um, this second edition, he said like, he wrote like 50% of the book. He is a new stuff, like he wrote it. And um, I mean, I really quite, really enjoy the book reading it, yeah. You didn't? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm reading it right now. I think I'm in uh, chapter six of the book. But you said you don't enjoy reading it. No, I'm quite enjoy reading it. Oh, oh okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Hello, it has a lot of. I mean, good recommendation. The book. Um, um, yeah, on Twitter you see a lot of people tweeting it. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm definitely gonna buy it then. All right, well, then I, Justin, you signed yourself up for uh, being a study buddy. So I'm going to hit you guys up when I have problems. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Right. Like, I need help with my homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe you can for the last chapter. Anyway, anyway yeah. We'll see. All right, guys. Okay. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Justin. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Justin. Thank you.